Hi, everyone, and welcome to UCLA's special virtual event on impacting diversity, equity, and inclusion in Hollywood. It's my absolute pleasure and honor to be moderating this event, where we'll be hearing from our esteemed panelists, Yalda Uhls, George Wang, and Gay Hirsch, who are all incredibly accomplished leaders in entertainment. We're very lucky to have them here with us today. So thank you all for tuning in to what I'm sure will be a very interesting and enlightening conversation. I'll start off by briefly introducing myself. So my name is Lee Lazar, and I'm a fourth year PhD student at UCLA studying social psychology. I've also been a junior fellow at the Center for Scholars and Storytellers for a few years now. I've been really pleased and inspired to see just how much the center has grown and the impact that this work has made since its inception. We've recently turned to focus more and more on authentic and inclusive representation and storytelling, which has been a very fruitful avenue of research and collaboration thus far. Uh, so a few housekeeping points before we get started. So I will mention that this event is being recorded and will be sent to anyone who RSVP to the event in the next few days. So if you know someone who couldn't make it or if you'd like to refer back to this later, it will be available to you shortly. I'll also mention that we'll be taking questions from the audience throughout the discussion. So please feel free to leave questions for our panelists using the Q&A function. And we'll try to get to as many as possible either throughout the conversation or towards the end. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their background, uh, their connection to UCLA and the work that they're involved in today. And I will go to you first, Yalda, and perhaps you could also provide a little background on the center as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for that lovely introduction. Lee is one of our superstar graduate students who has been with us since the beginning. Very proud of her. Um, and I want to thank the UCLA team um, who has, and especially Janice Shintaku, who has really um, helped us put this together. Um, and of course, the other panelists who you will be hearing from. Um, so we were really, really honored to um, be working with UCLA um, when we launched the Center for Scholars and Storytellers. Uh, my background is I used to be a movie executive. I was in the film business. I actually, um, and Gay Hirsch and I actually started here at UCLA getting an MBA before going into the film business. She went to television, I went into films. And then I ended up um, stepping off that career path and deciding to get a PhD in developmental psychology right here at UCLA. So I've been at UCLA two times for two graduate degrees. And um, I studied child psychology, developmental psychology, um, and I studied how media impacts kids. And I decided to launch the Center for Scholars and Storytellers because of these two expertise that I had. And because I knew there were content creators, storytellers, executives in the business who really do care about how the content impacts the world. Um, they go into, into, I went into movies. I grew up in Berkeley. I'm like, I want to change the world with movies. And there are plenty of people like that, but their business model, of course, is to make money and have people see the content. So I felt that because I had an understanding of the entertainment industry, um, I could bring the incredible science that is being done at places like UCLA and all over the world around social science, diversity, equity, inclusion, mental health, and bring it to content creators. So we are the only youth-centered organization that bridges the gap between social science research and media creation. Um, and our mission is to uh, collaborate with the creative community to unlock the power of research-informed storytelling to help the next generation thrive and grow. And we've been honored to have our work featured in Deadline, the New York Times, um, all sorts of different places. And we've worked with um, places like Disney, YouTube Kids, um, Stars, Lionsgates, Creative Artists Agency. We've been hired to do a lot of different work with industry. So the model's really working. Um, we still have a long way to go and, and um, in particular to deliver on our mission, but the model, we've only been around for a few years. This is, we're going into our fourth year. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Lee, to bring on the next panelist. Yeah, George, do you wanna go next? Um, sure. Uh... Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm George Wong. I'm a professor of screenwriting at the UCLA Film School. Um, I started out as assistant. Um, in fact, uh, during my assistant days, uh, Yaldo was a high-powered executive at Columbia, and that's where we first met. 
Um, I then took my experiences being an assistant and made a movie called Swinging Sharks about the horrible bosses I had. Yaldo was not one of them. I just want to assure all of you that. <laughs> um, and that sort of began my route of being a writer director, uh, which I've been fortunate to do in uh, features and TV for the last 25 years. Uh, one of the most recent films I wrote uh, was directed by Gina Kim, a uh, film professor at UCLA, and she encouraged me uh, to apply. Um, and, you know, uh, there was a, a, uh, an opening at UCLA, uh, and she said, hey, please come and teach. The students will love you. And so that's how I ended up at UCLA. And then Yalda found me. Uh, she discovered I was uh, joining the UCLA faculty. She reached out. She told me about the Center for Scholars and Storytellers. And I thought, oh my God, yeah, this is a great initiative. This is a great institution. Why would I not want to be a part of that? And so I'm happy to be one of the collaborators uh, at the center. Awesome. Thank you, George. And Gay? Hi, everyone. I'm Gay Hirsch. I'm the EVP of Development at the CW Television Network. And, you know, it's funny, I had a little bit of the reverse path of Yalda. So I actually, um, in my undergraduate degree, studied psychology. Uh, okay. And then I, um, I, I was pursuing a PhD, actually, in psychology. Uh, so Lee and I have a lot in common there. And I still love everything about psychology. And I find that it's very related to what I do in my job now, the very same interest that I had about what makes people tick and what, you know, what are people's motivations and good, good character stories are very related. But I, I did pivot in the middle of my PhD program and moved to LA where I realized one did not have to be an actor or a director or a writer to work in the entertainment business. And that was a revelation because I didn't know anyone who worked in the business. So I did go to UCLA uh, Anderson School and got my MBA in entertainment management, uh, which was fantastic. And from there, I did work in the movie business for a number of years as well. So I worked uh, in Disney in, uh, in the movie area. And then I went to HBO and made movies directly for HBO for a number of years. And, uh, and I also worked with Tom Cruise and Paula Wagner at their production company making movies. And, you know, whether it was a, a stroke of genius or just good luck, just around the time that I started to feel like the, the types of movies that were getting made in the studio system were fun to eat my popcorn and watch, but they weren't necessarily the movies that I felt that I wanted to work on or, or make or felt equipped to make because they were about you know, theme park rides or whatever they were about. It wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do. Uh, and I said, hey, TV is having a little bit of a renaissance and uh, it's all about stories and characters. So I became very interested in looking into the television business and I got lucky enough to be hired at the CW first in current programming. Uh, and then I switched over into development a few years later because that was much more in line with what I had been doing before. And so I have been there since uh, basically the inception of the network, which was at the end of 2006, and have uh, worked on many of, of the shows that I hope you all watch. Awesome. Thank you. We're very lucky to have all three of you here. Um, I'll start off with a few questions for everyone so we can kind of just go around and answer them. Uh, so first off, uh, we've made great strides in the past few years to really highlight the importance of authentic and inclusive representation in storytelling. I've really shown that betting on a diverse cast and creative team can lead to huge financial wins. However, there's still much work to be done as many of you have mentioned uh, and certainly room for improvement. So how do each of you think we can continue to move forward? And more specifically, what steps do you believe need to really be taken in order to make real progress in Hollywood? Um, so I'll let anyone who would like to start, <laughs> start us off. I'll start again. Oh, and then, go ahead. then I'll go hand ahead. it off to Gay. So, <laughs> so um, sorry, George. Uh, so I think, yes, we've, I, I mean, again, you know, Gay, perfect timing and television really is where it's at. It's so interesting how it's shifted. And I sort of felt like perfect timing for uh, launching the center because, um, the industry has really changed quite a bit in terms of valuing diversity and multicultural content and really making it front and center as part of the creative process. Um, I think that, you know, 
uh, out of UCLA came the UCLA diversity report um, that Dr. Darnell Hunt um, authors, and it's been going for many years, and they performed a very important service very early on before a lot of other people did it, where they really looked at diversity metrics in front of the camera at first, then they started looking behind the camera, then they started looking at even executives and agents, and then they started looking at box office um, to try to make a business case. And that's helped a lot. That's helped the industry really advance. Um, what we've been doing at the center and what we launched was a report called the Authentically um, the inclusive representation report, we call it the AIR report, where we found that um, not having a diverse and inclusive, authentically inclusive representation within the storytelling, not only in front of the camera, behind the camera, um, but also free of stereotypes and tropes. If you um, make a piece of content, a movie free of stereotypes and tropes, um, you can uh, earn as much as $32 million more at the box office opening weekend. Had a great graduate student re lead that work. And Lee is working with that student and myself to continue this work um, with organizations like Lionsgate and creative artists agencies to really start to understand the business case. And as the audience is changing more and more, we have to pay attention to in front of the camera. That's what young everyone sees. We have to pay attention to behind the camera because everyone deserves opportunities to tell their stories. You know, we're, we all do. But we also have to think about what's in the storytelling itself. You know, how, and often that is connected to who's behind the camera. Um, so somebody behind the camera who's telling a story that they've had a lip, you know, they've experienced it. They will most likely tell a story free less less filled with stereotypes. So, um, but it's not always the silver bullet. So we, I think we need to get there. We need to think there's a lot, you know, we're we do workshops um, with organizations like Disney, Warner Brothers, where we're looking at things like um, colorism and intersectionality and gender identity and expression and all these sort of, you know, topics that weren't top of mind, diversity. It used to be just diversity. Then we added inclusion, then we added equity, and now we really need to dig deeper. So hand it off to Gay to really talk about the creative side and how that's going. Thank you. Well, first of all, you know, when you're talking about making the business case, I will say I'm proud of the CW for years and years. We've been a leader in, in diversity, representation, equity, inclusion, just because we think it's the right thing to do. And we've recognized even before studies were coming out that it's good business. So I'm really happy to hear that there are studies supporting this. That was always our feeling. Um, and look, we, we've been really cognizant for years of having people in front of and behind the camera who represent our audience, because we know our audience, which is made up a lot of, of young people, of millennials and Gen Z who really have made it known that they wanna see themselves on screen. And it's important for us to be able to deliver that to our audience. Again, it's the right thing to do and it's good business. Um, so we're, we've been really, really making a lot of strides. And I think, as, as I said, a leader in the business of our behind and in front of the camera representation. Recently, uh, we are the only broadcast network that's been invited to participate, or I, I don't know if other ones were invited, but we actually are participating in the Congressional Black Caucus HBCU Challenge, um, which is a great honor. It's a terrific group of people elevating HBCUs in the, in the public eye. Um, we have two projects coming out that uh, go hand in hand with this initiative. One is a spinoff of our show, All American. Um, hopefully some of you know about that show, but it's set in Los Angeles. And um, that show is about a football player in, in LA, but the spinoff All American Homecoming, which will be uh, on our mid season is set at an, a fictional HBCU. And it centers on several characters who are college students who are finding their way in the world and really showcasing the specialness of HBCUs. We're also doing an unscripted show uh, focusing on the Prairie View Marching Band, HBCU Marching Band. So that will be a docu-series that we're very, very excited about. Um, 
the other thing to mention, you know, all of our, our new scripted shows for the upcoming season have at least one of the creators and one, if not more, of the leads of the show being people of color. So 4400, which is premiering very soon, All American Homecoming, which I just mentioned, Naomi, which is a DC title centering on a teenage black superhero, and Tom Swift, which is um, a really cool reimagination of a book series based on a white, you know, inventor um, reconceived as a queer black inventor billionaire. Um, so we're working on, on getting that one together for, for next uh, mid-season. So that's all, you know, really positive. At the same time, we recognize that it's not only just in front of and behind the camera that we need to focus on. We really need to look internally at our own company. And we've been really looking hard at that. Who do we hire? Who's in the room? Who are the people who have voice in the creative content? And we have outreach to the community in terms of social issues, community participation, making sure we're in business with businesses that share our values and, and want to have extreme representation. Uh, we have mentorship programs internally, formally and informally to, to give people a leg up to learn about the business. We, uh, we have internships. And in general, we just have a mindset of inclusivity, right? You have to start, you have to say, this is important to us and this is what we're going to do. So we, we recognize that we've made some progress. There's more work to be done, um, but we're doing it. And, you know, I think it starts with just having the intention of making sure that we're hiring people who represent different backgrounds. We're making sure that the writers that we're working with and the directors and all the storytellers have, have unique cultural experiences to bring to the table and use the specificity of their experiences to tell very universal stories. And I will now pass it over to George. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, it, there's not much I really have to add, except, you know, look, I mean, uh, thanks to a lot of the studies that you say has been doing, that the center has been doing. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think Hollywood does want to get you know, a more diverse, um, you know, talent, both in front of the camera, behind the camera, in the executive boardrooms. Um, yeah. Um, and, you know, ideally UCLA is going to be the, you know, sort of the nurturing ground um, where we're going to train the next generation of talent, uh, this diverse talent. So, um, yeah, they will be available um, to, you know, CW and everyone else who is in desperate need of diverse um, talent. Um, but, you know, what, what's particularly great about the center and even like, you know, my first sort of workshop there was, you know, yeah, it is sort of, yes, we understand it's a money business, you know, it, yeah, the color that we, the studios seem to care most about is green, but, um, you know, Yalda made a presentation between Obama and Glee, and I don't know if you want to, because you can, you've done this a million times before, yeah. So, you go, you go. <laughs> yeah, no, you've done that. So you she want put me up to a slide of Obama and she put up a slide of Glee and she said, which do you think has made more impact in sort of people's attitudes, um, you know, towards diversity, um, you know, having a, a black president for the last eight years or this show on Fox, you know, um, and it turned out, yeah, having Obama didn't really move the needle in people's perspectives of, you know, um, of race in America. Glee though, what was it, 13 and a half or 15%? Yeah, 13%. Um, yeah, measurable, um, yeah difference in attitude towards, um, uh, yeah, the LBGQT community. And that was remarkable. And, you know, hearing that, yeah, it's something that I tell my students, it's a responsibility we have as not only filmmakers, but as storytellers out there. And this is a very, very powerful medium. Um, and we wanna train you to use it for good. Yeah, and I would just say too, too UCLA, I mean, a third of our students are first generation college students. So to reinforce George's point, um, you know, the students really are, you know, they come from all sorts of lived experiences and all sorts of socioeconomic statuses, um, all sorts of different cultures. And they, you know, we walk the talk and live. That is, you know, the number one public university at least according to US News, not Fortune, but <laughs> I went to Berkeley, so I, I'm okay either way. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Lee, I'll hand it off to you. 
Yeah, I remember that actually distinctly from the workshop too, George, mm -hmm. uh, the Glee versus Obama. Um, so I'll move on to the next question, uh, which will sort of kind of get at what you already talked about. But so while you all work in the en entertainment industry or have worked, uh, each of you really bring a unique background, experience and expertise to the table. So that being said, coming from your respective roles, how have you seen your work or the space that you work in change in the last few years? And in what ways do you think it needs to be changed moving forward? So kind of getting at some of the things you've already spoke about, but if you have anything to add to that, um, you're welcome to. Well, I can certainly jump in on that one. When I started in the television business, um, you know, working in the in the current department, which is the team that works on the shows after the pilot, it's for the ongoing show. So there was a lot of staffing that was going on in my job and, and continues to this day, even in development, because we put together the writing staff for the new shows. And when I first started, there were a lot of old white guys who were showrunners who would hire their friends to be on their staff. And the argument was, well, certainly they weren't saying, well, this is because it's my friend. They were saying, I've worked with this person before. I have a comfort level. I have a responsibility as the CEO of this ongoing concern of making this television show to hire people who I know will deliver and write good scripts. And that's sort of the way it was in the television business for a long time. People hired people that they knew that had worked with them before and had a lot of experience in the business. And I'm, I'm really grateful that things seem to be changing. Everyone seems to be really aware that the, the best stories will be told by having a variety of perspectives and people have to get a little bit out of their comfort zone and hire people that they might not have thought about before or just be open-minded and read some new, new writers that they didn't know or get recommendations from their friends of other writers who have worked on, on shows and just have a different perspective. You know, again, going back to the mindset, it's like if we all say this is important, we can make a change. And, you know, and on, on all of our shows, we really do have a very uh, diverse and inclusive group of writers. Not that we can't always do better, but we think it's important. The showrunners have really come around to that and realized that they get better and more inclusive storytelling. And they're giving the audiences what they want by having these different perspectives weigh in on, on the characters and the stories. Yeah, just to sort of echo that gay, I mean, yeah, um, when I started in the business, yeah, I mean, I did not see a lot of Asian faces around. In fact, one of my first jobs was um, as a reader at Paramount Pictures. And I remember every night when I would walk across the lot, everyone would yell out, hey, Teddy, Teddy, because um, Teddy Z was this upcoming, like, big power executive at Paramount. I never thought I was Teddy Z. You know, it's like, no, I'm not Teddy, I'm just a reader. You know, so it's like, oh my God, really? There's only two Asians on the entire Paramount lot, <laughs> you know? Um, um, but now you look around in boardrooms and yeah, I mean, even when I was casting my first film, so like five years after my first film, uh, I was doing a panel at Cape and uh, Justin Lin and the cast of Better Luck Tomorrow showed up and said, hey, why do you not cast any, you know, Asian Americans in any of your movies? And I said, well, none of you showed up to the casting. So there were open calls. Why, why weren't you there? You know, so um, it, it was really hard to find sort of other faces in the room. Um, and, but fortunately, you know, I look around today, I just look at my classrooms. Yeah, uh, you see a lot more, um, you know, back, yeah, when I made my first film, they proclaimed me this like Asian American filmmaker going, yeah, the, the movie's about Hollywood. There's no, okay, it's weird, but it seemed like, yeah, because I, it was one other, uh, Kyle Hata, who like, uh, she directed Picture Bride. The two of us were held up as like this new wave of Asian American filmmakers. Like, uh, my film has nothing to do with, okay, but sure. <laughs> but yeah, but you look around now and it seems, yeah, the, the talent pool is growing. You're seeing a lot more faces around, um, you know, unfortunately with the reports that <laughs> we see, you know, we still have a long ways to go. Um, but believe me, you know, it, it's a huge change from, uh, you know, uh, what I saw coming up in the business. And sorry, I'll just add one more thing to, to what George was saying. It, it goes back to that old, if you can see it, you can be it sort of thing. You know, it's like yeah. the more faces that we show people, this is a job, you can do it. And the more we give opportunity to up and coming writers, directors, talent to have the experience, you know what, in a few years, 
they will be the people who are experienced and who have done the job before and will be the new showrunners who will then hire the next wave. So it's 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 an evolution and we all just have to be, you know, party to it and make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. No. That and is I the number you. one question I get from like a lot of my students, especially my Asian students, like, how did you get here? It's like, uh, well, we're supposed to just discuss it at first act. It's like, no, no, <laughs> how did you get here? Because I can't chart that path. It's it's unimaginable for them. But like you said, if they can see it, then they know there is some path uh, forward to it. Yeah, and I, I would like, when I first, when I was a creative person, what the thing that I remember, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, or the social impact person, you had to go to their like meetings and it was the last thing you wanted to do. It was always a, a way separate. They reported to HR. That's what it was about. Now DEI seems to be diversity, equity, and inclusion is embedded in the storytelling process. And when I launched the center, I really was like, I was a former movie executive. I feel that if I can create tools and resources for storytellers, content creators, and go directly to them in a way that feels that resonates for them, they will use these tools and it won't feel like a burden. And I won't be like, oh, you're an HR person, you're a CSR person, you're, you're, you know, you're on the side. Um, and, you know, I would never have thought, and I, I work with this wonderful woman at Disney, Vicki Ariasu, who um, we've done these workshops together that are 50 to 100, you know, showrunners who are excited and give us feedback that they really appreciate the chance and the opportunity. And many of them are still older white males, you know, at least half those rooms are still, um, but they're open and we, we never do it with shame or blame. We motivate with the carrot, not the stick, you know, so we're, there's room for all of us to learn and they're excited. And then there, there are people of color and women in the room that are excited to have their voice heard. And they're really excited to learn about other people's experiences because I think they really understand it's going to improve their storytelling, just like Gay said. Awesome. Well, it's it's encouraging that at least things are changing in the right direction from all of these different avenues of entertainment. Um, so I have a few questions for each of you individually. And I'll remind the audience also that you're welcome to leave any questions using the Q&A function. It's next to the raise hand, I believe. Um, but this question is for George. Um, so as a very accomplished professor, a screenwriter and director, could you tell us a little bit more about how UCLA's film school addresses diversity, equity and inclusion in its curriculum? Have you noticed any positive changes since doing so? And one more thing, um, how might UCLA's work stand out or differ from other schools? And let me know if you need me to repeat any of those. Okay. What was the <laughs> middle one again? <laughs> um, so I don't know how to accomplish, but yeah, so I'm fairly new to the UCLA community. I've back fairly new to academia. I've only been doing this three years now. So I'm still trying to, you know, get my legs, see legs under me. Um, and yeah, and understand, you know, just the depth of the UCLA community and the history around me. Um, just, you know, full disclosure, um, I went to USC film school. I applied to UCLA, they rejected me. So I had to go to the other school, but <laughs> I'm here now uh, and grateful to be so because, you know, UCLA has a great rich history of, you know, diversity and inclusion, um, especially the film school. Um, you know, uh, one of the things the film school is proud of, uh, proudest of is the LA rebellion movement. Um, so back in the late sixties during the civil rights movement, uh, UCLA came up with this ethno communication uh, initiative said, hey, we need to admit more, uh, we need to start recruiting uh, from, you know, um, the African American community, the Asian community, the Chicano community, uh, Native Americans. And so in the late 60s, they let in this whole swath of filmmakers who really have pioneered, become pioneers um, in cinema. Uh, Charles Burnett, who uh, uh, wrote and directed Killer of Sheep, uh, To Sleep With Anger, uh, Julie Dash, who's most known for Daughters in the Dust, um, we have, um, um, yeah, a, a whole list of long filmmakers who, you know, have this rich tradition and it's something, yeah, we want to continue um, moving forward. Um, so, you know, in past recent years, you know, we try to do more stuff to include that. Um, but um, so we have appointed an associate dean of EDI to basically, you know, come up with initiatives and what more can we be doing? Uh, so one of the most recent things uh, that been put on the table that we voted on as a 
uh, faculty community that we want to, you know, uh, legislate is uh, all the faculty have to take two workshops um, every year, um, uh, you know, uh, diversity workshops. We just had a wonderful one that was spearheaded by uh, Robin Chapman from Harvard University, um, who gave a workshop on rendering the invisible visible um, that, you know, really took a look at, you know, oh, we all have these blind spots and microaggressions and, you know, yeah, that we, we aren't aware of day to day. And here's, you know, some just just by being aware of it, you know, look, we're not going to fix it overnight, but, you know, awareness obviously is the first step. Uh, we want to offer these uh, same workshops to these students as well. Um, one of the things that we want to do, so you know, even just little touches. So uh, Melnitz Hall, which is the you know main uh, film school building. So when you walk into the lobby and there's a theater there, um, all the posters are all these movies from the 90s. And while I'm as big as a Jim Carrey and Andrew Dice Clay fan as a next person, um, <laughs> it doesn't really, <laughs> you know, put up a, a, a great sort of um, first impression of, you know, the great diversity that we have at UCLA. So, um, and I get it, we're a public institution, you know, it's not like we, you know, believe me, the poor staff there has much more to worry about than changing around film posters, okay? So, you know, um, but again, those type of like just weird tiny cues that we need to be aware of, that's something we're working to fix. So we want to do a, a plaque or something that will memorialize, uh, you know, the uh, LA Rebellion and the black filmmakers that came from that. Um, let's see, other things we're doing, um, you know, we're engaging with the students a lot more. So we've created student committees um, that will actually review our curriculum. Uh, the review or syllabi. It's something that the nursing school at UCLA does, and we're sort of following in, in their example. But, you know, one of the things we want to do is, you know, we understand it's an active process and that we want to create this sort of back and forth, this, you know, organic discussion and moving forward, uh, you know, to, to create, you know, an environment that is going to be conducive to learning and acceptance um, in the program. Did you see my movie is what the, my very first movie, Me, yeah. Familia, My Family, that mm -hmm. poster's up there. I think Greg Nava was a UCLA guy too. Yes, yes he was. And yeah. uh, so you have at least one. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. That was, that's really encouraging and amazing. Um, my next question is for Gay. So in your impressive 15 years in various leadership roles at the CW, um, as you mentioned earlier, the CW is really a leader in DEI, both in front and behind the camera. So how have you and your colleagues really made steps to integrate authentic and inclusive representation in the various series that you've worked to develop? And is there a particular show or a work that you're exceptionally proud of? And are there any key insights that you could share with the group regarding how you've seen a show succeed versus one that you might've struggled a little bit more with? And again, I can repeat any of those questions. Yeah. So. You know, I think it all starts with making sure that the people who are telling the stories come from a variety of backgrounds and have very specific experiences, right? And, and I think I alluded to before, as, as someone who works at a broadcast network, it's obviously important for us to get the broadest audience possible, right? So we want the most number of people to be able to enjoy the show and relate to it and find it authentic. And at the same time, I think I'm not alone in thinking the best storytelling comes from specificity, right? And, and, and from not seeing the same thing over and over and over again, right? What's original, what's different? So we all have families talking about me familiar, right? So the Greg, Greg Nava's family might be different from my family, might be different from anyone else's family, but there's a relatable concept at the core if you're telling a family drama we all can relate to sibling relationships, parental issues, um, you know, whatever else comes with the family. So someone who grew up in South Central LA might have a different experience than someone who grew up in Beverly Hills. Yeah, we have a show All American, which really looks at both of those communities and, and what, what was the experience growing up and how do you navigate being you're from one community and now you're integrating into another community. So I would say that's a real success. If you look at a show like Jane the Virgin, which is no longer on the air, but was one of our really big successes. It was very specific in that it was about a Latinx family, but it really was a story about three generations of women, right? Putting aside the pregnant virgin, which is to get you into the show and the telenovela, which is, 
you know, okay, it's, there's a world to this show. Really was a, a show about three generations of, of women in a family and dealing with their personal issues. So, you know, in terms of how do we do it, we, we are lucky enough to be a network. So a lot of people bring us projects. We put the word out to our studio partners who we work with in an ongoing way to the agencies and the managers who we work with to that, that that's the type of material that we want. We're very specific in saying it's incredibly important to us to represent all of our audience on television. Um, and we just, we, as y'all to use the term, like we walk the walk, we don't, we don't just talk about it. We really make sure that that's what we're doing. We are very focused on staffing our shows with writers who run the gamut of all types of experiences and backgrounds. Um, we, we really push the showrunners if, if they're, I, I wouldn't say they're resistant, everyone wants to do this work, but sometimes it's hard to find the person and you go, well, I really need a mid-level mid -level writer who can write great plot and I haven't found it, but I know this other person and they're, they're you know, they're, they sort of seem like the type of people we've seen a lot before in writer's rooms and so we'll push to say, have you really overturned every, you know, every stone to, have you read every writer of that level? You know, have you reached out to the WGA, you know, and there are many programs where you can find writers that you might not have experienced before. So we, we really push that. And I'm not sure, I, did I answer all your questions? Was there another one in there? I believe, I believe you answered <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Um, no, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and now this one goes to Yalda. Uh, so transitioning from entertainment to academia, can you walk us through your aha moment that really drove you to found the Center for Scholars and Storytellers? And along with that, bridging entertainment and developmental psychology, your two backgrounds, what are some key points that you would maybe share with the audience about um, the science behind youth and media usage? Um, and finally, <laughs> since you started the center, uh, what have been some highlights or key wins that keep you encouraged to do this work? So you kind of mentioned a few in your intro that you can kind of expand I mean, on. <laughs> the aha really was, I, I've always loved sharing the research and applying it. And I did that first with parenting. When my kids were younger, I was, I wrote a parenting book. I was very excited to share all the great research I was learning about. Um, the aha was there's so much great science out there that content creators probably have no idea about. And we forget what it was like to be young. As adults, you can't put yourself back there. It's, and, and researchers study youth. We study young people. We study how the teen brain works. We study um, how they learn. And, and that's how we know about what they're learning and how they're absorbing things. But content creators, don't have the time or the energy to focus on that. What they need to do are tell great stories, engage people, um, you know, just specificity is gay. I love, I love that word. And, um, you know, just really thinking about how can this research get into the hands of storytellers and be useful to them? So the one piece of research that I always share, and uh, George has probably heard this, but gay may not have, um, and people are welcome to put in the uh, Q&A your answers or the chat if you want. Um, there was a piece of research where a guy who studies how children learn how to lie, he read them three stories to see if any of them changed their behavior um, when they were put in a situation where they could lie or not lie. And, you know, we think as adults, oh, of course the child understands what we want them to understand. Or maybe we, you know, we put it down a little bit of a level of, oh, that's a little easier. But the reality is so much of what we're creating, we have no idea how kids are absorbing this. So he read them these stories. One was Boy Who Cried Wolf, one was Pinocchio, and one was George Washington and the Cherry Tree. And only one of those stories actually change children's behavior so that they lied less. In the other two stories, nothing happened. And these were three to seven-year-olds. Um, does anyone want to guess what the story was? George, do you know? Have I told you this one before? Uh, yes, you did, but I, I've forgotten. <laughs> Gay, have I told you? Do you want to guess? I'm going to say Pinocchio, because there's absolute consequences 
to the lie. Yes. So that is not right. And that is what when I and you're not making content for young kids. I actually shared this research in a room of writers, you know, all children's writers, preschool, you know, six to 11. And they all said Boy Who Cried Wolf, because that had very high consequences, then Pinocchio, but it's actually George Washington and the cherry tree. And one of the reasons is, is because that story has positive consequences. And, you know, it's a good parenting thing too. Kids respond to positive consequences when they're young, more than negative consequences. They focus on the fear or that it's not relatable. It also has to be very relatable. There's so much research. There's even research that says kids learn way better from real life than animation when they're young, yet all of preschool content is animated. So there's all this research out there that content creators don't know, don't have access to. I remember um, Lindsay Duran was in the room. She was like, oh my God. She, she does um, great. She, she consults with Sony Animation and she does a lot of great content. She was like, I'm going to apply this to all my movies now. You know, how do I shift that thinking? Um, so that was really my aha. And then the second aha was nobody's in the teen space and teens glee worked because it was for teens. Kids are, teens are figuring out their identity. They're figuring out who they are. They are, you know, us adults, we know who we are. We're not going to be shifted as much. Our, our mindset is more closed. The brain, neuroscience says that, you know, cognitive flexibility during those teen years, their, their brains are shifting so much and changing so much that it's a really critical time and stories and media 24 seven, right? I mean, that's what they do. They are consuming a lot of TV, a lot of YouTube. And um, this is a time period where you can really have impact and media can, storytelling is super important. Media and peers are super important. And we define adolescence from 10 to 24. So it's all the way through college. Um, you know, that's the time when kids are figuring out who they are and they're really sort of making these important choices in their life. You know, am I going to be a good person? Am I going to be a bad person? Am I, you know, will I, will I do this job? Will I do that job? Do I see myself reflected? How do I see myself reflected? Um, we just felt that was a critical time period that no one's, you know, looking at. There's a, there's a lot of um, researchers that work in the preschool space and Sesame Street really established that if you work with researchers, um, these shows can not only be engaging, look how much Sesame Street has endured, they are also really, really powerful and teach. There's a lot of research so Sesame Street teaches. We don't have that in the teen space. Um, we don't have it even in the six to 11 and above. And I, we just felt like we want to shift the norms so that People in content creation understand that we can be your partners. We can support you. We will bring you research that will be helpful to you in your job um, in a way that won't distract you and feel over, like a burden. So fingers crossed we're doing that. We've been doing it with the workshops. One thing I'm really proud of, or a few things, is our thought leadership research, the AIR report, which has now been written about in LA Magazine. It keeps coming up in IndieWire. It's led to work with Stars and Lionsgate and CAA, as I said. Um, I'm also very proud of um, some work we did with Mattel on a curriculum um, to um, shift gender stereotypes for young kids. Um, and our mental health work. Um, we did a study on 13 Reasons Why that we published. And I'm just gonna tease it. We have, a, I think, a really important study coming out on November 9th around race and class in teen television shows, top 10 television shows. Jane the Virgin is one of the ones we looked at because of course it's a top show and I think Riverdale was too um, in 2019. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, I feel like it's a bombshell about what the kind of kind of stereotypes and tropes that sometimes content creators don't know that they're doing. I mean, we don't call out any show. We look at all of the shows as a whole, but um, we found some really interesting things around race and class. And I see there are a lot of questions, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I will go to the first one and thank you, Yalda. So the first question that came through was, um, how about ageism in the entertainment industry? That's a good one. Anyone well, I'll just tell you why I decided to go into academia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all made it, so. 
Um, I was like, I don't want to be a step, you know, I don't want to, I want to work for a very long time. And the industry is challenging as you get older. Um, mm -hmm. George, what were you going to say? Yeah, I mean, yeah, look, I mean, that's something that I know that I was worried about too. Um, and in fact, that was one of the sales pitches that my friend from UCLA said, hey, you know, you're getting to that age, you might want to start thinking of your second act. Go, what? You know, um, uh, yeah, she said, you know, you should take this opportunity while you have it. But that being said, um, you know, look, I, I'm in my 50s and, you know, I'm still working, you know, as much, if not as, you know, more than I was in my 20s. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, having sort of, you know, the academic side, you know, helps me inform the work and, you know, and, you know, obviously life experience, all that, you know, having kids, you know, it just, it changes everything, your perspective and everything and makes you a better storyteller. Um, you know, the question I, I guess would be asked again, you know, like, yeah, are, you know, I, I know that these programs, um, you know, the um, uh, diversity programs and fellowships, you know, they do tend to target more the baby writers, but are, you know, are there opportunities for, you know, older uh, writers and directors and talent? I think absolutely. Um, you know, television has a history, I believe, even more so than film of having playwrights work um, on staffs and even creating shows. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to read a lot of playwrights who I might not have known before, who some are new, some are young, and some have been working for a long time writing plays. So I think that's always a fun discovery when, when there's a writer who's had a whole career writing really interesting and successful plays and they want to transition into television and they get hired on a staff, which I'm not saying happens all the time. You know, let's be real. Ageism is a thing, um, both for creators as well as executives. You know, I'm hoping no one kicks me out anytime soon, but you never know. And I, I think it also depends where you work. I happen to work at a network that that does target a little bit of a younger viewer. And I am certainly not in the demo uh, that we target. And many of my colleagues are a little bit older than the demo as well. We try to balance it out and make sure that we're also representing the young people we're trying to target because we don't want a bunch of people who are over a certain age trying to say, this is what young people want to see on television right now. So we, we get a variety of opinions in our creative group and also with the showrunners and, and the teams that we're working with. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a real thing as, as both Yalda and George have said, um, but I, I do believe in this day and age where we're talking about all sorts of DEI, age is one of the categories that everybody is also looking at to make sure we're not neglecting any talented people just because of ageism. All right, no, absolutely. Like our own graduate student body in the screenwriting department, we've got 27 year olds, we have 55 year olds. I have a mom of two teenagers who's commuting from Wyoming to attend classes at UCLA. So yeah, so, you know, we have a, a wide range, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, we want good storytelling is good storytelling, you know, it's what's on and, the page. And, you know, for someone who transitioned into another career, I still have found a way to bring it back to Hollywood and media. So, you know, there are other acts, but you're still just as George said, you know, you're still bringing that all in. And I was a lot older of us getting my PhD and there was a 70 year old getting a PhD um, who came from the film business too. So, so, I mean, you're never too old to also try different things and that might inform the work you do for Hollywood. Amazing, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience. So how much if any overlap is there between the film school and the theater arts department? with respect to inclusion, diversity, and equity initiatives. So George, I feel like you can answer this one. Yeah, um, so when I first joined, it, yeah, the theater department and the film department, they're sort of like separately siloed. Um, since then, uh, so Brian Kite is our new dean and he's from the theater department and he's very much an inclusive, let's tear down the walls kind of guy. Uh, but even before that, um, so the, the, uh, one of the theater professors, uh, Myung Ho Chi, Myung Chi Ho, uh, who's a professor of scenic design, was the equity person. And yeah, and she would reach out to me uh, during my first you know, two years at UCLA and just check in with me and see how things were going, take me out to lunch and just, you know, yeah, say, hey, what can we do to improve things? Uh, and now we have Ellen Scott, uh, who was our associate dean of EDI. And yeah, she's an accomplished uh, 
film scholar looking at uh, African American censorship. Um, you know, a cinema civil rights uh, is her seminal book, and yeah, and she also not only covered, even though she's a film scholar, she's also uh, addressing the theater faculty as well. So yeah, we're all trying to move forward as uh, one one school together, and I think that's really Dean Brankite's vision for us. Yeah, that's great. Another question, we have a few actually. So there were a few Latin films made in the 90s, but there was no follow-up generation of filmmakers in the next decades. So how can we make sure that there's a constant flow of new POC talent slash content to end this drought? Feels like gay. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I'm not sure I can add to anything I've said before, except to make sure that we're looking, you know, that we're looking in all the right places, we're getting the word out, we're, you know, that's what we're buying, the, the more that we, you know, dollars get people's attention, right? So if we're buying more scripts from people of color, and then we're putting those shows on the air, and people see them, that in, first of all encourages more people to think they can do it, right? So you you make the pool bigger of people who have pitches or have scripts that they want to sell. And then when there are successful shows, we all know everyone chases what the most successful thing was elsewhere, right? So the more we can show success with people of color in front of the camera, behind the camera, creating all of all of the different aspects of the business, it will invite more people to model that behavior. Yeah, and, and TV is a great, you know, a place too for, so um, uh, one of our alum, uh, Patricia Cardoza, who directed Real Women Have Curves, you know, uh, she gave an LA Times uh, interview recently, uh, right around Sundance, because uh, they were celebrating her film there, the anniversary of her film there, and she was talking about, yeah, it was tough for her because, you know, she went and started a family and disappeared from you, but, um, you know, when she came back, TV directing was her way back in, you know, uh, guest directing on shows at the CW really helped her, you know, and other networks really helped her, you know, sort of get her foot back into the door. Um, and that being said, yeah, I mean, look, you know, at UCLA, we're constantly keeping an eye, looking to sort of that next generation of filmmakers. Uh, one of the initiatives we have with the undergraduate program is, um, so we our, our transfer program for the four-year undergrad uh, program. So the, uh, the juniors, seniors who come in, who transfer in, almost exclusively taken from community colleges and underserved communities, um, not from within UCLA. So, you know, that's a, again, a way for us to keep that supply chain going. Yeah, absolutely. And this question kind of goes along with the last. So how come the Latinx community is so underrepresented on the big screen, even though they're the largest minority group in the US and among the most ardent moviegoers? I mean, I think that's, I don't know if we know for sure. I know when I made Me Familia, you know, a very long time ago, I think we released it in the mid nineties, early nineties. Um, the person that was running New Line then, um, the head of distribution thought that, oh, this is a huge audience. This movie is going to resonate. Everybody, the Latinx audience is going to go. And it actually ended up being probably a larger white audience. Um, you know, it was because it was a relatable movie about a family that anyone could relate to, but it didn't actually, um, that audience didn't go see it. I think part of the reason is um, it, that audience hasn't been there. It's changing. There are many more advocates in that space now, but they haven't traditionally advocated in the same way. You know, the Asian community um, has advocated with gold, gold house and cape and, you know, paying with their dollars, showing that they will show up to the theater <clears throat> when they see themselves. The African-American community community, which also um, is a very large um, television and movie going audience, they um, they will, you know, go to movies where they see themselves reflected. And I think that, I mean, it's also a very diverse community, so it's not very easy to create one show fits all. Um, so I think these are some of the reasons, um, but advocacy is, is important. Anything to add? Cool. Um, so the kind of last question that we can get to. Uh, so what do you believe are the top specific priority areas for research on DEI in films and TV that need more work? For example, you mentioned race in a class. 
Um, yeah. So, so I'm actually that. curious to hear what everybody says on this, even though this was written to me. Um, I mean, for me, I, I'm very interested in doing impact, understanding how seeing yourself on screen, um, you know, might impact your uh, social and emotional well being. There was a study that was done longitudinally over a year where they looked at 12 year olds and how much television they watched. They looked at white girls, white boys, black girls, black boys, and the kids who watched the most television. Um, they, they measured their self esteem at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study. And of the kids who watched the most television, only white boys self esteem increased everybody else's decreased presumably because they were not seeing themselves reflected or if they were they were in lower status areas you know it wasn't great role modeling that was done in 2012 i feel like we need to see more to understand sort of you know and and I, you know i don't know what the design is but to really understand how seeing yourself on screen shifts the way you feel about yourself, maybe, um, you know, and also like thinking buying behaviors a little bit too, like, you know, there was also a study that looked to see if, you know, African Americans will watch themselves more when they see themselves more on screen. And they did find a relationship between um, viewing data and content. Um, you know, I don't know if those kinds of studies have been done in business as much, um, I think I'd love to do more business. I mean, we are doing, Lee, and we're, we're working on st a study looking at a large sample of movies to find out, you know, about the business case more and more. Um, but I'd love to know about what you think, Gay, and television, and, and um, what do you think would be interesting? Well, it's it, this is less of a research directive as an observation, and maybe there's research that comes out of it, but, you know, more and more, and, and I'll speak specifically about Black audiences with this comment, because I don't know as much relating to this point about other audiences, but I know there's been a real movement for Black audiences to want to see different types of stories about Black characters, right? A lot of content, movies and television that features Black, that, that feature Black stories are about oppression, about struggle, about, you know, things that are very important. And I'm not saying we should not tell those stories anymore, but there's a whole mess of stories out there that are about joy and excellence and positivity. And I'm curious, you know, what, what audiences reactions would be to when you're talking about self-esteem when watching a, a movie or a television show, you know, if you're constantly bombarded with only one type of story that's about struggle versus seeing all types of human experience. Um, I think that's an interesting area. Oh, I completely agree. And we, we, we've done work on that with foster care kids who only see, you know, and, and there have been some good, like the fosters and, you know, they only see sort of, oh, that's my whole identity when there's so much more about them. I think there's, there's a lot of movement around that. That's a great point. George, any ideas? Yeah, no, well, I mean, again, there's multifaceted. Well, uh, again, that sort of DEI training took with Robin Chapman, you know, it's sort of like trying to break apart identity. And she had all these Venn diagrams of, you know, all the many facets of all the ways we can identify ourselves with. So, yeah, there's mm -hmm. definitely race and class, there's gender, uh, family situations, religion, you know, there's so many ways. But, you know, I think all those perspectives, you know, you want to make a character as rich as possible, and all those should come into play. When you're writing and creating a character um you know uh always tell people so like john cho is famously notorious or if he sees asian american in the character description of a script he'll pass immediately and won't read any further because he goes that's reductive you know I, you're basically reducing me to a race and i'm so much more than that i'm a father i'm a brother i'm a good friend i'm you know so you know and as an actor you want to play more than just race and how do you as an actor do you even play race so um i think the main thing we want to like sort of focus on as we move forward, you know, even as storytellers is that, you know, the, these choices we make can humanize a lot of these issues, um, you know, as, you know, a lot of these hate crimes have, you know, I've been listening to all the conversation and the thing that kind of stuck with me is that, you know, um, a lot of these hate crimes occur because people don't see other people, uh, Black, Asian, as humans. And, you know, media has 
the incredible power to humanize us. And so, yeah, seeing that on screen is an incredible power and responsibility for all of us. Here, here. That was yeah, I was going to say that's a good line to end on. Good end it. <laughs> You're scripting the lines, George. You're always scripting. And that was the my audition for, for the CW show. Oh, <laughs> Wait, please get in the writers' room now. Well, this is being recorded, so you can look back at it later and remember. Um, but I just, <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for for being here. This was really, really amazing and interesting to kind of hear from you all, your different expertise and backgrounds. Um, and yeah, it's just been wonderful and we are over time, but uh, we just can stop talking, I guess. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you, any other thank you. closing yeah, remarks? Yeah, thank you, Lee. You of did course. a great job, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And thank you, Gay and George, um, for supporting UCLA, the center, and and um, caring, caring. Thank you know, Gay, Gay is, and you, George, are both filmmakers that, you know, and content creators that, that are exemplars of caring about the work you do. Well, thank you for putting this together.